Hello everyone, uh, this is Mihai of Masari. I run the Web3 protocol research team and together with me I have uh, three panelists. Uh, we're gonna speak about decentralized cloud storage. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, why it's needed, how it is implemented and uh, what the adoption looks like. Yeah, so with further ado, I'm gonna ask each of you to give a quick intro about uh, yourselves, about the projects you're working on, uh, what are the problems that you solve, and uh, what are the solutions? Um, yeah, starting with you, Josh. Hello, testing. There you go. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm Josh, founder, CEO at Bundler. So when it comes to the world of decentralized storage, we're most renowned for, for being a scaling solution for Arweave. Uh, so Arweave is a permanent data storage blockchain, essentially. So the idea is that you pay once and your data is stored forever. Uh, and Bundler essentially enables you to scale that, so you can scale the number of transactions that you can write per second. So right now we do around 95 plus percent of the transactions that are written to Arweave uh, come from Bundler. Cool. Uh, great to meet everyone. My name is Jonathan Victor. Uh, I work at Protocol Labs. I lead ecosystem capital there, which you can th sort of think of as sort of like chief evangelism officer. Um, so yeah, Filecoin, we are a decentralized storage protocol as well. You could think of Filecoin as being one part of a broader ecosystem of tools that are really trying to enable all the functions that you see out of the cloud. Storage is sort of like the first thing that it does today that's sort of cold, verifiable storage today. Um, but building on top of that, we have things like Saturn, which are building retrieval networks for uh, distributed CDNs, uh, compute protocols like Bakalyao, trying to enable sort of like the distributed compute, and being able to tie all those things together with smart contracts using the FVM. And last, I'm uh, John Gleason. I'm Chief Operating Officer for Storage. Storage is also a decentralized cloud object storage provider. We have a network of 22,000 storage nodes in 105 different countries today offering a drop-in replacement to Amazon S3. So we have a service that's just as durable, sometimes two to four times faster for customer use cases or more, uh, but 80% lower cost. And so we're really addressing that segment of the market that is trying to disrupt the hyperscalers like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Backblaze, Wasabi with enterprise-grade cloud object storage built on decentralized infrastructure. All right, uh, thank you for the introductions. Um, so in the grand scheme, we have decentralized uh, cloud storage as being a relatively new technology. And whenever we speak about new technologies, in order for them to be adopted, they have to be 10x better, faster, cheaper than the incumbents. So my question for you is, how are your solutions being better than centralized cloud storage? Um, Jonathan, how about starting with you? Sure. So I think one way of thinking about Filecoin is it's picking basically a different part of like the spectrum of use cases and just starting there. So typically when people think of like building an application, you might be looking directly at the cloud, but of course the cloud is going to charge you a pretty high premium in order to use their services. Filecoin operates as an open market. So anyone who has a data center can sign up. I mean, they effectively are buying the token, locking it, committing capacity into the network, and then you as a client can come in and provision some of that service from whichever provider you want on the network. So the nice feature is, is it means you get basically this open market of providers. You can get full price, uh, the ability to price all the way down the market. Um, you see storage providers who are offering services at dramatically cheaper costs. And so for a lot of the reasons why people come, it's generally just because, hey, look, I can get a cheaper service for the thing that I need that meets my needs. Um, so we've seen that with folks like the Victor Chang Institution that's down in Australia. Uh, they've started moving their data over. We have research institutions like Berkeley. And a lot of it is just, look, for the service that they need, how do they get it at the cheapest cost? And having an open market can do that. So we're seeing uh, similar things. And for us, um, I think the thing that unlocked uh, larger scale adoption has been performance. And so being globally faster than Amazon, globally faster than uh, Azure, has really built credibility with customers. But now, most importantly, we're seeing two new factors come in. Um, you know, cost is always a factor, but today it's really opening doors for us in the Web two, Web 3 space into Web 2 because solutions that customers wouldn't have considered 
uh, even a couple of years ago. Now, because of cost uh, implications, they're willing to look at. And when they see that it's faster, just as durable, um, just as reliable, more secure because of zero trust principles of Web3. And then on top of that, because we're using underutilized infrastructure that's already being spun, powered, and cooled, it's an incredibly low carbon solution as well. And so it really ticks all the knobs for enterprise buyers. And so that's really what's driving our adoption today. Yeah, so for Arweave, it's a little bit different. So Arweave is a, is a net new technology in the sense that permanent storage has never existed before. So it's not so much that we're tackling uh, kind of existing existing markets. So it's not about being kind of better or faster than what currently exists, like perhaps uh, storage does with uh, on the S3 side. Fundamentally, we're looking to create a new technology which will serve, at the end of the day, new use cases. So you know, we've already seen um, fairly good adoption, at least from a you know, percentage-based um, me measure, uh, with new kind of net new kind of Web3 um, high-value uh, data like NFTs and things like that. So when we're, th when we're thinking about uh, competition with traditional kind of storage providers, we actually try to avoid that comparison overall because we're fundamentally serving use cases that those providers can't serve in, in any way whatsoever. Um, so I guess to, to speak about the, the fundamental value propositions there, when you, you're using something like Arweave, if you pay once, the data is stored forever. This is a very different model to um, existing you know, S3 providers where you pay monthly and fundamentally the data is censorship resistant. So no one can take that data down, whereas you're still at bay of the, the centralized providers in the world of kind of S3, et cetera. So Arweave is, is a little bit different there. All right, so we spoke about the value proposition of your solutions. Uh, now, my question is, how long do you think it's going to take for these solutions to get adopted at scale, to become mainstream? Um, John, would you like to start? Yeah, so uh, from a storage perspective, we're seeing that adoption now, and we're seeing that adoption growing at an incredible rate. And initially, it was driven by, by the conversations around cost, but now we're seeing it really being driven around global performance. And so we're seeing customers that are moving over from traditional enterprise software. Uh, we just had a customer who's moving over multiple petabytes of data from an IBM CleverSafe implementation that's end of life. And so we were able to step in and uh, get in place of that renewal. On the Web3 side, it's great that uh, we see partners like uh, LivePeer, where we have a great integration as the storage layer for LivePeer Studio. We have a joint customer who spends probably 10 grand a month between the two companies doing their transcoding and video streaming. Their Amazon equivalent bill was about 80 grand a month. So this is a business that either exists or doesn't exist because Web3 technologies are serving that. And so we're seeing a growing list of companies that are just willing to consider this in higher ed, in the medical space, uh, media and entertainment. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a function of, of deep end where we're seeing that adoption today because of those value props. Okay. Um, so I'll provide a little bit more of a longer term perspective. I think we, we've already seen adoption in the world of Arweave. So when it came to the previous kind of cycle, we saw a uh, huge growth in the world of NFTs. Uh, I think during the, I don't, I don't know the current statistics, but uh, during kind of 2022 or early, early uh, during that year, uh, Arweave and specifically Bundler was responsible for about 92% of the NFTs on, uh, on Solana, where a majority of NFTs were being minted across all the chains. Uh, and we've also seen kind of growth around social. So we have Lens who've recently started using Bundler as well. So we're already seeing adoption uh, within a lot of places in Web3 across several different kind of verticals and use cases. But fundamentally, I don't think I don't think we're there yet. And I, I, I say that in a in a positive sense because I think we're less than five percent of where probably actually less than one percent to be honest of where we will be in kind of 10 years time and I, I would probably I'm speaking for kind of protocol apps and Falcon here but I, I would also say that you guys are also not all the way there yet and there's actually a lot more uh, there's a lot more growth opportunity for I think everyone on this panel right now um, so yeah you know, I can't give you a prediction as to when this stuff will be kind of uh, reach mainstream but I think it's very safe to say that we're very early right now and we've only kind of captured a very small percentage of what of the value that we can capture in in the next kind of decade. 
Yeah, I mean, I'd probably put my answer in between the two of you, as I am also seated between the two of you. I think, like, we are seeing enterprise adoption today. I would say, like, so Protocol Labs is just one of a set of people who are working in the Filecoin ecosystem. Honestly, most of the deals that are being won, where it's, like, who is actually pushing out enterprise adoption is not Protocol Labs. It's different community members. So it's, like, storage providers who are building their own businesses, some of them who are building their own storage on ramp so they can resell to other storage providers. So just being a platform layer is, like, an onboarding agent. And so I think, like... Part of that is actually figuring out how do we use the superpowers of Web3 to create the economic flows where it makes sense for someone to create a business to bring other customers into this broader community. So I think that's like one part of it. But then I think the other part of it is just the tooling and how do you actually make these things really deliver for the use cases that make sense. I think given where Filecoin's like ecosystem is today, it's primarily targeting more of these like cold verifiable archives. They're really like large scale storage, but it comes with this really interesting verifiability property, given Filecoin uses all of these ZK snarks on top of the data. And so you end up seeing the industries that gravitate towards it tend to be things that are like healthcare, financial institutions, folks who have large scale data sets, things where the properties of the data match the things that Filecoin does today. As you see some of these other use cases coming online, things like Saturn with the distributed CDNs, we have more people looking at Filecoin for hot storage use cases, things that couple IPFS and now are able to use something like Saturn to do the content acceleration. When you take things like Bacal Yao and being able to do compute over data, there's now a whole DSI community and folks who are trying to leverage the Filecoin GPUs as the compute layer. And it just so happens that the storage is sitting right next door that they can just upsell the storage if you're a storage provider. So I think like in terms of what is going to bring mainstream adoption and how we cross the chasm, I don't think it's going to be an all at once sort of thing. I think it's more like you're climbing this mountain and each incremental thing moves you from base camp one to base camp two. And the most interesting question is like, how do you chart your path so you're going up like the least gradient along the way? And just a question for, for Filecoin, what do you see being the biggest value driver for Filecoin? The storage side or the, all the peripherals? So the CDN stuff, the, the, IC, uh, the IPC and things like that. Is it the compute side and the consensus side or is it more the storage side? I mean, I think they all compound on top of each other. So like when I describe Filecoin as an ecosystem, this is going to be hard to do without a visual, but I will try to use my hands. I try to like describe it as having these five pillars. So you could sort of think of three of these as like services. So you have storage retrieval as compute, storage retrieval and compute as sort of these like verticals that you have different amounts of progress that are happening. So storage today is sort of like cold storage, but people are working on hotter layers to get to that S3 sort of like layer. You have things like retrieval that get you to CDNs, and then compute is sort of like the EC2 type things that you'd expect. Now, those are all services that anchor into a shared block space. And so the actual interesting thing for Filecoin is that we do have this blockchain that has all of these services anchored into the same sort of shared economy. And so now you can start writing programs with things like smart contracts to say, how do I want to, how do I want to compose these services together? If I want to take one storage deal and say, once this deal ends, store another copy, I can write a smart contract to do that. I can just set a bounty and say, once one of these copies is offline, someone now store another one and I'll only release my funds when that new copy is stored. It also means I can start programming value. So I can start using DeFi to fund uh, like different forms of like services. So if I want to say, here is a contract, generate yield on these funds, and then use the yield to fund every recurring deal after, you can do that. And so I think like long term, what drives the value for Filecoin? It depends on which Filecoin you mean. If you mean like Filecoin, the entire economy, I think that's slightly different because I think it really then is about how seamless can you make the connectivity between all of these different pillars. If we're talking about just Filecoin, the storage network, I think that honestly is about the quality of the data sets that you're bringing in because that's going to drive the demand for things like the retrieval services, the compute services, et cetera. Um, yeah, thank you for the explanation, Jonathan. Um, yeah, you spoke about storage, retrieval, compute, and I'm also going to borrow your metaphor regarding yeah, climbing the mountain of, uh, of adoption. So historically, crypto has been quite difficult to use. So there is a user experience problem in, in crypto. And uh, the question for you is, do you think at the current point in time, decentralized storage is in that moment where the crypto components have been abstracted away from the user so that the end user doesn't know anymore that there is crypto at the back or decentralized storage at the back? 
or how long do you think it's going to take us to to get there? Yeah, I mean, I'll give a short answer, but then I'll pass it off to these two. Um, I think it is not fully there, but the things that are getting the most success do the best job at hiding it. My sense of how a lot of the Web3 infrastructure is going to evolve is you're going to basically get a bunch of companies that look like thin wrappers on top of like a distributed backend. So what I mean by that is there's teams like Banyan that are working on platforms targeting enterprise. Specifically, they want to have the contract relationship with an enterprise customer, but then they're basically like reselling the Filecoin network on the back end. And so being able to basically say like, if you want to build a CDN, you should be able to like create a website, take customer dollars, like have a, you're the place that they're dropping the credit card. But then behind the scenes, you're contracting out to the Saturn network where you're distributing the load across all of these other nodes. And I think we saw this actually with Terra. There was like teams like Alice that were basically like sort of like uh, reselling sort of like the Terra anchor thing. And obviously that didn't end super well. But I think uh, you can sort of imagine what this looks like on the infrastructure side, where it's like once you have actually the scale out of the hardware, you'll probably see a bunch of startups that really are just focusing on the customer service side and orienting themselves there. And then anyone who wants to just tap into the pure hardware themselves, they can go at the protocol layer and literally just make bids, go through auctions and all that good stuff at like the core protocol. Yeah, I, I tend to agree very very much that having a compatibility layer that sort of makes your application look familiar to Web2 providers, makes, makes it easy to do that adoption where instead of having to hire people to learn a new protocol, to build everything from scratch, if you have that abstraction layer where you're immediately compatible, it makes a huge difference to adoption. And then once you've kind of got them in the door, they're, they're compatible, then they look at it and go, well, what else can we do? What else does this web thing, thing do? My bill is lower, my application is faster, I am happy, is there more? And then you find these native integrations where they are willing to put in developer time and build these integrations and get even more speed. And so we have uh, a number of partners, um, one of them is a company called GB Labs, they're in the media production uh, workflow um, space. They built an S3 integration first, and it's just like, oh, our application just works with this, great. Upload via S3, but they needed it to go even faster downloading. So they did a native integration with our protocol. Their application, a, a Web2 app in media and entertainment, speaks native storage protocol on download. And they're doing the massively high parallelism peer-to-peer -peer downloads. And so I think that you know, by, by building those sort of gateways into Web2, we'll pull in those workloads, and then they'll see the true value of the rest of the ecosystem, and they'll start to expand and explore other things. And so I think there's, there's a huge opportunity in that compatibility, that simplicity, and then that expansion into value. Maybe just to add on to that, I do think like one of the core things that Web3 infrastructure gives us is sort of like everything is shared interfaces. And so I think even for these new startups, people like the Banyans of the world, like the actual core value prop is an anti-lock-in one where it's like, look, you can build on top of this. And if in the future you want to take over like your own ownership of everything or you want to switch to another provider, you don't have to switch where your data is sitting. It's literally just all interfacing to the same hard drive. And I think that actually is a killer feature, especially for like normally for enterprises who may find it harder to bet on a startup to actually have this backstop of like, hey, there is like full portability of the back end. Yeah, I mean, uh, very true. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll echo kind of what the, the other two have said, um, but Bundle as a business is very focused, to be honest, on, on abstracting a lot of the complexities of using Arweave. Um, so w when you're using, I'm sure when you, I, I, I haven't used uh, Filecoin too heavily, but I'm sure when you're using all of these blockchain solutions in some form, there are nuances that you need to really understand when building on top of them. So we are actually one of those startups that has worked to abstract away a lot of those complexities. Um, right now, we still are kind of very uh, Web3 focused, so we still work with a majority of Web3 startups, but we also, um, you know, while Meta still had their Web3 focus for about uh, two years, um, we, we did work with Meta and they, 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 they wanted to avoid the, they wanted to abstract away as much of the Web3 stuff as well, um, simply because most of their developers, or I'd say 50% of their developer team, um, weren't particularly Web3 kind of, you know, Web, Web3 kind of had any know-how. Um, so we really had to work towards the kind of lowest denominator. I feel like I'm just insulting Meta. I, I'm not trying to. But um, but, but, but more seriously, um, I expect that mainstream adoption will require a lot of abstraction. Um, and fundamentally, that is something that we're, we're very focused on. Um, and we expect to, yeah, we expect to grow. So we, if we want more Metas of the world, 
using Web3 technologies uh, like they did kind of a year ago, then it's, a, it's an obvious step that needs to be taken in order to see that kind of adoption. All right, so we spoke about adoption, we spoke about killer features. Um, now my question to you is, what excites you most for the year to come? What are like areas of growth or where do you see the next wave of innovation coming from? I think for us in the really, really short term, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a very, very short term kind of uh, perspective, but I think wh where we're seeing a lot of adoption right now is actually storing high value data sets. So I'd say specifically within Web3, there are some data sets that are worth literally billions of dollars. If you look at uh, you know, different blockchains, L2s, these are like the raw ledger itself. You can value itself at the, at the valuation of the kind of, of the, the state that it's securing. So I think fundamentally we'll see a lot of growth in the next few years when it comes to storing a lot of these high value data sets. Um, I think we're already seeing that now. I think Filecoin's also kind of doing some things that are, that are similar to that as well. And that's, that, that's definitely kind of in the short term of adoption. I think on the protocol side as well, Arweave is having a kind of a, a soft fork, I guess, or actually, no, sorry, it's a hard fork. Hard fork in a few months' time. It's going to provide stabilization on the pricing, which means that building startups on Arweave is going to become that little bit easier because you'll be able to provide like more kind of stable pricing. And I can tell you being kind of one of the, I guess, biggest spenders of, of R on the network, um, it is very difficult to kind of do a lot of the dynamic hedging. We have to do a lot of hedge fund-like activities, but in the coming months, that, that, that kind of stuff is going to be stabilizing. So I'm hoping that this is kind of going to be a, a big step towards having you know some, some more startups being built on, on our weave. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess, so using that sort of like visual I was talking about, I would say like in each of those verticals, there's something different that it gets me excited. I guess my meta answer is the fact that there is something in each of those verticals that gets me excited is the exciting thing for me. Um, I would say, so on the storage side, I think the things that Banyan is doing to basically bring all of the cutting edge stuff that people have talked about, not even inside of Web3 only, but like the local first community about like crypto capabilities. So being able to strap like crypt trees to IPFS content, being able to bring that to market in a package to enterprise is actually a really hard problem. And I think they've actually pulled that off. So I'm really excited about that. Um, there's teams that are building better capital markets. So I think this is actually one of the more fascinating intersections between quote unquote real world assets and like being able to use like the financing of a blockchain to fund actual businesses on chain. So all of the Filecoin miners being able to borrow against the different services that they're running through things like Glyph. Um, on the computer for data side, there's folks like io.network that are working on harnessing all the GPUs on the Filecoin network to be able to just resell to AI companies. Which again, another really cool use case, which I think is also only enabled through things like the FVM. Um, and then there's all this other cool stuff with like CDNs and scalability. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's a bear market. People always say it's like a builder's market too. I think genuinely the amount of stuff that's happening is the stuff that keeps me excited, but yeah. Yeah, for me, it's, it's first and foremost about customer adoption and seeing that we're focused on real problems that real customers have and, and seeing that first crop of not just like the, the early adopters, uh, SMB players saying, okay, yeah, we're saving hundreds of dollars, but seeing enterprises saving tens of thousands of dollars being referenceable and leading to growth. And then I think that, that sort of earns you the right at the table to really expand with new capabilities. The other thing I like is, is seeing more um, full solutions coming together. So not just, you know, sort of going as a point solution with just storage, but like uh, within the Filecoin ecosystem, building end-to-end -end solutions that customers can say, oh, okay, I understand the full value chain. Um, video storage and streaming between storage and, and live peer. It's an end-to-end -end solution. All the components are there. There's a bunch of Web2 uh, providers where we have technology partnerships with um, uh, the, the sort of main backups, the utilities that you'll see in the space in, in Web2, but then service providers who then bundle and, and resell. And so seeing those solutions both in, in Web2 um, coming together for enterprise, but even better in Web3, where you know I think we'll, we'll see down the road is a lot more partnerships bringing new services to market with the best uh, that each platform can bring. And so I, that's what really gets me excited is seeing Web3 delivering value, like the first real mainstream value that people are seeing today, and then where it can go. Uh, very exciting for me. All right. Um, thank you very much for the great answers and uh, keep up the great work. 
Uh, unfortunately, we're at time, but uh, we don't stop following the space, following decentralized storage and the whole Web3 infrastructure space. So at Masari, uh, we're doing that on a regular basis. Uh, please follow our research at uh, masari.io slash research or on Twitter at Masari Crypto. And um, yeah, look up for some upcoming Twitter spaces out there. Thank you so much, everyone.